Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you today. I'm really honored to be in a group like this. I was talking to the Director General about this before. Um, I think what you're doing is, is absolutely wonderful because at the end of the day, this doesn't happen with a whole bunch of people in an organization, a very large organization, who understand science, engineering, and mathematics, people who are very well educated in those subjects and who practice it extremely well. I used to tell my mother, my mother was always very, very nervous when I went up to fly into space. And she was always worried that I wouldn't make it back. And I always told her, I said, don't worry. I said, I'm one of the few people in this world that has literally thousands of extremely smart people behind me, protecting me and making sure I'll come back every time. And that's what this school is all about. The education you're getting is going to allow the UAE Space Agency and the other businesses here in the UAE to do absolutely wonderful things. But you can only do it if you have a very educated and well-educated population. And that's what this college is about, to give your country and the world more educated people in the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, what I'm going to show you today is a video. It's a short video. It's only 12 minutes. But it is just uh, small snippets of um, things I did on my three space flights. And it highlights the tremendous capability that the United States Space Agency has and also what the space shuttle could do. So without further ado, I'll show the video. I'll narrate it myself. And then after we have the video, I think we have about, um, about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. And I'll take questions. So if you could start the video, please. That is me, by the way. This is a patch from my first mission. This was a science mission that I did in 1997. That's me getting dressed after my period in quarantine. And that's Jan Davis. She was our payload commander on the flight. The next person you're going to see is Bjarni Trygvason. He's an Icelandic man who actually lived in Canada. And that was our commander, Kurt Brown. And all of us, with another two other people, went up into Space Shuttle Discovery. This is us on the pad. It's kind of interesting once you get inside. Everybody else gets four or five miles away, and then you launch. And the first thing you do is you light the main engines. The main shuttle main engines put out about a million pounds of thrust. And then it's so much thrust that the whole structure flexes about 18 inches forward. Once it gets straight again, we light off the solid rocket boosters. The solid rocket boosters put out about 3.3 million pounds of thrust apiece. So you have about 7 million pounds, or about 4.5 million kil um, kilos of thrust. And the vehicle only weighs about half that, so you're going. And it is a very quick ride. It feels like you've been rear-ended by a truck in a car. Once you get up about, uh, about um, 66,000 meters, then the solid rocket boosters come off and you do six and a half more minutes to, fl to space. Once we get up there, we start uh, about the task of turning this rocket ship into an orbiting space and science platform. We open the payload bay doors. That's how we get our cooling through radiators on the inside of those doors. And then you'll be able to see exactly what's in the payload bay. And every time you see this on each mission, it'll be different. In this case, we've got a satellite, a German satellite. We've got a robotic arm from the Japanese space agency. The satellite is, like I said, from the German Space Agency. We also had a bunch of other experiments. We let the, this satellite go for 10 days. It was doing upper atmospheric science and Earth's atmosphere, and then caught it back. It had recorded all of its data, and then we bring it back for analysis here on the ground. On the inside, we were also doing experiments. I was in charge of an experiment called Bioreactor, where I was actually growing colon cancer cells. And the idea was these colon cancer cells that you're about to see would actually go from individual cells to cell aggregates, doing the first steps to forming a, a colon cancer tumor. And the idea was to learn how it did that. Also, of course, we had to do the mundane things in life. One of them was eating. This is actually a celebratory dinner we had after we had finished our Japanese experiments, we uh, ate with chopsticks um, to celebrate the successful robotic experiments. And we also did experiments of our own, as you can see, just showing uh, how water and fruit juice mix. And one thing that we did almost every day is we exercised. The reason we have to exercise is because your body loses bone density and muscle mass when you're in space, because it's not being taxed enough. So you exercise to do it. 
But probably the most fascinating thing is looking at the Earth. And believe me, this is an absolutely beautiful planet you live on. From space, it is even more beautiful. We also saw the uh, not so beautiful part uh, of, um, of the atmosphere. This is actually Super Typhoon Winnie in the Pacific Ocean, which had uh, winds of up to 250 kilometers per hour and uh, ripped across the Pacific back in 1997, summer of 1997. And we saw these sunsets and sunrises. You see one every 45 minutes because you go all the way around the Earth every 90 minutes. So that's what that was. Right. On my second mission, we had a decidedly different mission. This mission was designed to take the United States laboratory up to space station. That's space station as it looked when I went to it the first time. And that's our payload bay. Like I said, very different. And what you see, that big can in there is the US lab. It weighs about 10,000 kilos. And uh, the first thing we have to do is rendezvous with the International Space Station. Both vehicles are moving at about 27,000 kilometers per hour, but yet the people who designed them designed them so that they could be kept in their attitudes uh, down to a quarter of a degree, which is pretty impressive. And also the closing velocity between them is about two centimeters per second. So it's very, very slow even though you have these huge vehicles moving at very, very fast speeds. And that's allowed by, like I said, the people who designed this, not guys like me who operate it. Once we um, actually join together, we pull the two vehicles together, open up the hatch, and go see our friends. At this point, this was actually the first crew to man the International Space Station that was up there in the light blue. Um, it was one American and two Russians. And uh, we hadn't seen them for about five or six months because they had left the United States and then had two months of training before they went up. Once we uh, dock with them, we close the hatch again, we get dressed into our liquid-cooled underwear, and we prepare for our first of three spacewalks. As you can see, you've got Mark Polanski in the middle getting, uh, getting us dressed. And although they say that you put on your spacesuit, in this case, you really kind of get into it, as you see there. I had a little trouble with my helmet, so he helped me get that on. We let all the air out of the airlock, and then off we go on the first spacewalk. This first spacewalk was designed to actually connect the United States laboratory to the existing part of space station. As you can see, we put the laboratory in the space shuttle upside down. So we, first, we had to flip this 10,000 kilo can on its end, and then move it in towards the rest of space station. All right. That's actually me taking this video right now of that happening. Once we got them connected, we use laptop computers to drive the bolts together, and we get to open it up and play. So that was Sergei Krikalov. He had, at that time, more time in space than anybody else in space. You could see you could do all sorts of things when there's no gravity. We also had to do spacewalks to outfit the outside of the laboratory. And the reason we had to do that was because all the stuff didn't fit on it while it was in the payload bay of the shuttle. So that's what we're doing here. We're actually co um, connecting a power and data grapple fixture to allow the robotic arm to join onto space station. And we also put shutters on the outsides of the windows to protect those windows. And once we got it on, we opened it up, and uh, we took off the MLI, the multi-layer insulation. And the first thing I saw, and this is my helmet cam that you're seeing right now, is Sergei Krikalov inside. And once I saw him, he actually asked me to wait because he was going to film me while I was filming him. And actually, you could see this uh, scene in the IMAX 3D Space Station movie. I'll give you a little view of Space Station as I left it on this second mission. This is, we're all the way in the back of Space Station right now in the service module, which is a Russian component. And then we go through a docking port, and then we go into functional cargo block. This is big, a big storage container. We keep clothes, food, water, all sorts of supplies that we need to live in space there. If you continue back through that, you go through another docking port, you'll see a change in the color and just the general layout of the vehicle. And that's because we're going from the Russian operating segment to the United States operating segment. As we go into it, we go into the, the node, which you saw us in last time when we first joined with Space Station. And then we take a 90 degree turn down and we start going there. Forward is the lab, as you can see, but we've already been in there, so instead we'll go straight down. We go through a docking port, and then we come into the airlock on the space shuttle. You actually see Tom Jones' suit on the wall there on the right. And now, 
If we go all the way to the bottom of the airlock and take another 90 degree down turn, which means we're actually going forward now, you see Tom Jones in the uh, bottom floor of the space shuttle. On well, my third mission, I went back to space station, but this time it was to add another part to the truss. The uh, way we rendezvoused with space station was different on this mission because we had just two flights before lost the Columbia space shuttle. And so we did a flip underneath of the space, uh, space station so they could take video and make sure that our heat shield was intact before we try to come back home. You can see the payload bay is very different this time. We've got a big closet in there, and we've also got a truss piece in there. We came out on the first spacewalk, and the first spacewalk was designed to connect that piece of truss to the International Space Station. As you can see, the piece of truss coming up from the bottom of the screen, and us off to the left actually working. This is sped up a little bit because the movements are very slow. And also to rewire the outside of the space station electrically. And that's a picture of me actually over the Indian Ocean there. We also replaced a bunch of equipment out there. But the thing that made this shuttle mission unique was we had our first problem with a solar array on the International Space Station. If you'll see, if you look at the panels, we're sort of trying to fold it all into the box on the bottom, but it wasn't folding the right way. So the first thing we did was the same thing you do if you had a piece of paper that wasn't folded right. You shake it. So we actually went up to the space, uh, the solar array, and first I shook it, and then my partner, Sonny Williams, shook it. And we were trying to get the folds to go the right direction. We tried this for about an hour, and it didn't work. So what we did was we came back into the space, shuttle, space station. We collected our thoughts. The ground team, all the engineers on the ground, worked for two days to figure out how we were going to fold this up. And then we went back on a separate spacewalk. It was seven and a half hours to fold it in. And that's me on the arm on the right and Christopher Fuglesang down at the bottom. And what we did was we had a bunch of tools that we taped together so that they were conductive. And then what I did, as you can see on the right side, is I started spreading the folds out to evenly space them. And then we would contract the whole thing for a little bit. And then they'd get bunched up and then I'd spread them again. And we did this over seven hours to get the, to get the, um, the, solar array back into its box. And as you can see, the uh, guys in Mission Control were extremely happy that we did, because if we hadn't, we would have had to throw it away and build another one, and it cost about $130 million a piece. Another thing that we do is we take up microsats and small satellites, and we deploy them, as you see here, and we did that on that mission. After 13 days in space, it's time now to take this orbiting space and science platform and turn it into a big glider. It's a 250,000 pound glider, about 100,000 kilos. And what we do is we're moving at about 27,000 kilometers per hour over the Indian Ocean. We slow down to just over 26,000 kilometers per hour, and that puts us on the ground a half a world away in southern United States. As you can see, we're using our heads-up display to fly. At 100 meters up, we drop our landing gear. We don't want to do it too soon because it creates a lot of drag but we don't want to do it too late for obvious reasons. And then we come into land. And the most incredible thing about this vehicle is up until now, this is the only reusable spacecraft ever built. It can take up to, uh, up to 25,000 kilos into low Earth orbit. And the great thing about it is now, this thing went to the hangar, they refurbished it, put a new crew, a new tank, and new things in the payload bay, and it can go back up into space with another whole different mission and a whole different crew three months later. So that's the story of my three space flights.